Welcome Crossview. I'm so thankful to be with you this morning. It is always a blessing to worship with brothers and sisters in Christ and encourage one another. Would we feel the Lord's presence today and would we hear 
would he hear our prayers and praises. I invite you now to stand and sing to our mighty and faithful God with us. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. 
count on one thing The same God will never fail Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God will never lay Working all things out Working all things out Oh yes I will Lift you high In the lowest valley Yes I will Bless your name Oh yes I will Seek for joy When my heart is heavy All my days Yes I Won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God is never late, working all things out, working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Scripture has shown when his people cry out in distress, he will hear and deliver. He answers our cry for help, is our protector forever, as he promised. We can talk to him and he listens and responds. Yes, his works, he works all things out. And we can count on him because he will never fail. Last week we introduced a new song that speaks of the goodness of God, his unending mercy and faithfulness. Let's sing that together again. I love your voice 
You have led me through the fire and darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running out goodness. We don't deserve or earn it. It is you. It is who you are. Thank you for providing a way for us to be close to you as you come close to us, to be adopted as sons and daughters with constant communion for, with you forever. Teach us your way and would we recognize and trust your voice alone. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, Crossview Church. So glad that you decided to come and worship with us this morning. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors on staff, and I am glad you are here. Uh, if you're a guest with us and uh, are visiting with us for one of the first times, we have a gift for you uh, at the Welcome Center this morning, so you can stop at that uh, kiosk on the right-hand side on your way out, uh, and we would love to give you that gift. If you consider Cross your Church your church family and you would like to give uh, financially as an act of worship to the Lord, you can do so at either of the black boxes as you uh, leave the worship center or uh, via uh, one of our online options. Uh, a few announcements um, to cover this morning. Whoops. Um, so hang with me. So first off, kids, before you head out to Sunday school, uh, Blast Off is our children's ministry program. We did that three times this last fall, just once a month, uh, but we are excited to be ramping that up this spring. So Pastor Trevor uh, and his amazing team of volunteers are planning to hold that twice a month. Uh, so the second and fourth Wednesday of every month, so starting in January, that'll be the 11th and the 25th, so that's this coming Wednesday is the first one. Those run from 5.45 to 7 p.m. Uh, great opportunity for kids from pre-K on up through fifth grade to come and encounter the good news of Jesus. So parents, if you have uh, kids that are pre-K to fifth grade, plan to bring your kids on the second and fourth Wednesday of each month. Uh, maybe bring a kid from the neighborhood, have them invite a friend from school, something like that. We would love to see this ministry grow. Kids, bug your parents. Tell them that you want to come to Blast Off uh, both times every month. Uh, with that, kids, you can head out to Sunday school. Um, your teachers are eagerly awaiting you. And parents, if it's helpful for you to take your kids out, uh, feel free to assist them on the way. 
few more. So uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, seniors, we are launching a senior fellowship ministry. So uh, the third Thursday of each month, that means this month it's on Thursday, January 19th, uh, but monthly from 9 to 10 a.m., uh, come to Crossview. There'll be pastors present, hanging out, uh, have a great time of fellowship, encouraging one another, uh, doing some fun stuff. So seniors, if you're looking for something to do during the week, the third Thursday of every month, 9 to 10 a.m. here at Crossview. Uh, men of Crossview Church, we have a men's breakfast coming on Saturday, January 21st at 7 a.m. Uh, that'll be a great time to connect with other guys, uh, hear some encouraging words, have some good food. Uh, I'd encourage you to bring a friend to that, invite a neighbor, uh, something. Um, it's a great time. Come on out. At that, we're also going to be hearing more information about Men's No Regrets, which is coming Saturday, February 4th. A lot more details at the Men's Breakfast, but it's the 30th anniversary uh, of the Men's No Regrets Conference, so you're not going to want to miss that breakfast where you can get more information about this. Uh, about six or seven or eight weeks ago, we uh, started asking for our year-end gift, and all of that uh, money, or the, the goal of that gift was to raise $24,000 for Pastors Discipleship Network uh, in Uganda, led by Richmond Wandera. It went to fund a library there, and I have to say, you guys crushed the goal. That number on the screen is actually outdated, so since that slide was made, more money has come in. Uh, we raised, you raised, $35,797.65. Amazing job. Uh, the benefits of your donations are going to be felt uh, in profound ways and have a great impact for the gospel around the globe. Uh, that nearly $12,000 extra dollars uh, of overflow goes to our uh, emergency mission fund. So throughout the year, uh, missionaries, uh, like all of us, have unexpected things come up and may need a little extra support. And we love to be able to meet those needs throughout the year. And so thanks to your generosity, uh, we will be able to do so uh, in uh, big ways. So thank you so much for being so generous. Uh, finally, APEC students are headed to districts, the District Youth Conference this Friday. So that's a gathering of several thousand students over in Green Bay. Uh, Kale and his team of leaders are taking uh, some adults and students over there to encounter the gospel of Jesus. And so uh, I just ask that you be praying for them uh, this next weekend. With that, would you go to the Lord in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for who you are. We're grateful for the many ways that you've blessed this church, for the way that you uh, give us financial resources so that we might be a blessing around the globe, so that you could use that money to further your name and to make the name of Jesus great so that many might encounter the gospel. Lord, uh, Psalm 103 reminds us that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your faithful love towards those who fear you. Lord, as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our sins from us. As a loving father has compassion on his children, so you have compassion on us, for you know what we are made of, remembering that we are dust. Lord, we lift up apex and the students heading over to Green Bay and the leaders, Lord, would you give them a profound time of encountering you? Would you remind them of the hope of the gospel, that because of the shed blood of Jesus and his glorious resurrection, their sins can be separated from them as far as the east is from the west? Would you give leaders and students sweet time of fellowship and encouragement and loving one another? We thank you now that you've promised that wherever two or three are gathered, that you are among them. We recognize that the Spirit is among us this morning, and so, Spirit, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to the truth of your word. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and continue to sing with us?
remain standing for the reading of God's word. Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Luke, chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, and I'm reading from the NIV Bible. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, and we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. You may be seated. Would you please bow your heads with me as I pray? Father in heaven, we thank you that we get to come this morning and interact with you and know you and get to know your ways. And Lord, we just ask that you would meet us in this place, that you would, I'd have no idea of where people have traveled in life to come to this spot, but you do and you know what we need. You're a good, good father. And so would you meet us in this place this morning, we ask, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Did that do anything? Did that prayer I just prayed, did that really do anything? Did that leave my mouth and go into the hands of Almighty God of the universe and move his heart to move and act among us in this spot now? Did that really happen? Yes, Yes, amen, it did. But I think we can get to a spot where practices like prayer and things of that nature that were intended to bring us into the presence of Almighty God, that were intended to open up the eyes of our hearts to the awe and wonder and power of God, can so become part of the white noise of our life that we forget what they're really all about. Especially in a worship service setting, it could easily become just part of the routine, part of the religious reflex, I call it, where we just come and go with the motions and we forget that we are in the presence of Almighty God who created us and created all things. That's what prayer is. Now, some of us here 
would say we capture that. We feel that awe and that wonder every time we pray, and that's a wonderful thing. And there's some of you that consistently pray throughout your day. You, you go through and you throw up like these uh, breath prayers where you say, God, I need your help here. God, I need your help here. And that's a, a wonderful, great thing. And some of you have times where you set aside time to pray, and that's a great thing too. And then there's some of us who don't really pray at all, or we pray rarely. And we want to talk about this thing called prayer, because we all experience it in so many different ways. But the common thread, I think, in all of us, in all those people I just mentioned, I think the common thread is, if we really, really, really understood that we are coming into the presence of Almighty God when we pray. I think every single one of us, no matter what our prayer life is, whether it's great, whether it's not so great, every single one of us would say, I want more. I want more. And I'm really, really, really excited this week to begin a new series on prayer. We're going to spend the next eight weeks or so talking about this thing called prayer. What is prayer about? What is uh, happening when we pray? And I'm really excited about it. Because I've been actually, you're going to think this is crazy, but it's true. I've been dreaming about this series. I've been thinking about it and dreaming about it and looking forward to it because God is doing something in my heart towards prayer, and I think he's doing something in the heart of Crossview Church as a whole towards prayer. When we are praying as staff or at prayer meetings or as elders, God is showing up in pretty amazing ways, and he is doing something. And I'm excited about it, and I want to throw gasoline on that fire, so to speak, that we would become a people of prayer at Crossview Church, that we would become a people who stand in God's presence and understand what we're doing because it's for our good and it's for his glory. So what I want to do today is a little bit different than what I usually do. What I want to do today is kind of set the table for the eight-week series. So we're going to feast on stories throughout the Bible about prayer and what God did in them and how people prayed and what he actually did uh, throughout this series. But this morning, I kind of want to set the table for that. I want to kind of do a little bit more teaching versus preaching and just kind of set the table for what's to come. Carrie did an awesome job praying uh, Luke or reading for us the Luke chapter 11 the story where Jesus' disciples go to Jesus and they say to Jesus, Jesus, teach us how to pray. That's what they asked. This is a group of people that hung out with Jesus for 24-7, for about three and a half years, and they went to him and they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Now notice, they didn't say, Jesus, teach us how to live holy lives. They didn't say, Jesus, teach us how to teach the Bible. They didn't say, Jesus, teach us how to cast out a demon from somebody. This is the only spot in the New Testament where we see Jesus' disciples asking Jesus to teach them something. And the request is, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Now, what I get from that, what I see from that, is that by observing Jesus, the disciples of Jesus saw that all things stemmed from this thing called prayer in Jesus' life. Jesus regularly, regularly withdrew, withdrew to pray. He regularly spent time with his father. And I think the disciples caught that all the things he was doing, all the things that he was about, was linked to this power source. And the power source was prayer. That if we ask him to teach us to pray, if we learn to pray like he's praying, that will take care of everything. It was the cornerstone. And so they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Because they saw that everything he was doing was an overflow out of his time with prayer. That can be our prayer in this series as well. Lord, teach us to pray. No matter where we're at on the prayer spectrum, Help us take one step closer to knowing more what it's about. Teach us to pray. Now, as I mentioned, prayer can be a struggle for a lot of us. I know it can be a struggle for me. 
it is a struggle for me. And I want to share why prayer can be such a struggle. First of all, one of the reasons I think prayer can be such a struggle is we at times lose the wonder of God. We lose the wonder of God. We forget who it is we're talking to. This is something that's happened in my life over the summer and the fall of this past year. I felt like I lost the wonder of God, and thankfully by his grace, he's recreating that in me. But I found as a pastor when at times when you take this book and you use this book to prepare teachings and you use this book to counsel people and you use this book to try to defend the Christian position in a world that's becoming more and more hostile to Christianity and you use this book for all these things, all of a sudden this book can become a tool. And I forgot what it's really about. All of a sudden, this book was for me to analyze the world in front of me and put it through this analytical lens, and I forgot that this is the voice of my beloved Father. And thank God, he's meeting me in that place and reawakening my heart. And maybe for you, it's not a book because you're not a pastor and you're, you don't do those things as part of your job, but maybe for you, it's just the familiarity with Christianity. Maybe you've gone to church for a while, you're raised in a church type uh, church, or you've been raised in a Christian home, and some of these things have become just so part white noise as I share. They become so familiar, they lose their wonder, and they lose their awe. I was reading a book, and there's a gentleman who said he and his family, the author of this book, they went up to this a cabin in the North Woods, and they were up there, and he went for a run in the morning, and he, it was in the fall, and he went for a run. As he ran, he came around a corner, and he saw this field full of these little white, he said it looked like sh- seashells that were all white and dusty, and the field was like full of them. And he said he'd never seen anything like that in his life. And he went up and he grabbed it and it was like powder and it fell apart. And he said, this is the craziest thing. So he ran back to the cabin. He got his whole family and friends and said, you have to see this. They went running back. there. They looked at all this thing. And what is the first thing they do? Pull the computer out of your pocket. Look up what this is. Oh, these are frost flowers. And they develop when the temperature is this spot, the northern spot. And they, and they go, oh, we, we figured it out. We know what it is now. And he says, you know what? It was way more cooler when I had no idea what they were. (laughs) See, we live in a culture where we have to figure every single thing out. We have a computer in our back pocket with access of information that if we encounter something new, something awe-inspiring, something we don't know about, the first thing we do is Google it and figure it out and put it in our box so we can have it. When you live in that kind of culture, you lose awe and wonder really quick. And sometimes when we do that with things of God and church world, we can lose awe and wonder of who we're talking to. I think God wants to recreate the wonder of who he is, recreate the awe of who he is in my heart. And I say to you, follow me, church, as I follow Christ. And let's let the awe of God capture us again, reawaken us again. Another reason prayer can be such a struggle is we don't feel like we're good at it. We sit in silence and our mind wanders and it goes all these places and it's uncomfortable and nothing comes to our minds and we just sit there and we don't know if this is exactly what it's supposed to be about. Another reason we struggle with it is we don't see the immediate benefits. Some people pray and all sorts of stuff happens. When I pray, nothing happens. Sometimes we just don't make it a priority. Our lives are so fast pace. We're running at a breakneck speed, and we don't have the mental space or the attention span to just sit for two minutes and think about the fact that we're sitting in God's presence who loves us and cares for us and wants to interact with us and be part of our lives. Whatever the reason is for our struggles, here's what I've learned about prayer is you can never be guilted into a good prayer life. You can never get guilted into it. 
So in these next eight weeks, I just want to say this is a guilt-free zone because the truth is all of us struggle with this, every single one of us. And so instead of like harping and saying, we got to do this better, we got to do why don't we just come as a church family and say, hey, why don't we help each other with this? Because we know how amazing and glorious and loving God is. And we know that prayer connects us to him. But we know that life kicks us in the teeth sometimes. And so why don't we come in here and, and be a church family that says, let's encounter God in prayer in a new way. Let's ask him to reawaken our hearts to who he is. Let's ask him to recapture and compel our minds to what prayer and communicating with him is all about. Let's ask him to create a hunger and create a thirst that only spending time with him will quench. Now, we get confused a lot about what prayer even is. If I asked you what is prayer, we'd probably get a whole bunch of different definitions because we have all these different ideas of what prayer is. And so as we start off this series, I want to give us a basic definition we're going to use for the rest of the eight weeks. But before I do that, I want to I lay out a premise that this definition is going to sit on. And the premise is this, that God is a person. God is a person. Now, some of you may get that. Some of you, that might be news to you. But God is a person. And he's not just any person. He's the most amazing, most powerful, most wondrous, most godly, the most, he's the greatest person that has ever, ever existed. And when we come into his presence, we're encountering a person. See, that's my definition, is that prayer is a personal encounter with God. And for that definition to make sense, we have to realize that God is a person. When we pray, we're having a personal encounter with God. Notice it doesn't, prayer isn't talking to God, because sometimes you talk to God in prayer, but sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just sit in his presence and enjoy who he is. Prayer is this gift that we have. It's an invitation that we have to be with the Almighty. It's an invitation to commune, which means to be with Almighty God. And please notice it's not, when it says personal, it doesn't mean individual, because that can happen individually. But you can have a personal encounter with God in a group of four, or a group of five, or a group of a hundred. God is a person, and he wants to interact with his people. Now, there's lots of different kinds of prayer, and so I want to start off this series by talking about different types of prayer different types of prayer that we're going to see throughout the series. And so I want to put them out in front of you ahead of time because we're going to kind of be going back to these things. But someone once wisely said, there's only one rule to pray, and that's just show up and pray. Don't get caught up when I'm telling you these different kinds to say, oh, I got to do it like that. I got to make sure I do it. Right now, just show up and be with your heavenly father. There's only one rule to pray, and that is just show up. All right? But we see in the Bible different types of prayer. And as we grow in this thing called prayer, it's good for us to know these different types. So that's why I'm laying this out. So let's take a look. The first type is what I'm going to call connecting prayer. Connecting prayer. This is the prayer that simply says that, that we use this prayer to connect with God, to have this encounter with God. Some people call this be still and know prayer. Some people call this contemplative prayer. It's a type of prayer where you enter God's presence through silence and you calm your soul and you just notice that God is with you. And you notice what's going on in your heart and you bring that before God. Sometimes it involves taking a, a scripture verse and just reading that one verse over and over and over, and you say, what do I notice in this verse? And as you pause your heart and your life to notice something in God's word, God starts to talk to you about it. That's a connecting prayer. This is something you grow in. It's an acquired taste. If you say, I'm going to do this for four hours, and you never did it, you're going to 
feel really bad about yourself because you're going to think you failed. You start small in this and let God meet you in that place and grow. But connecting prayer is just enjoying God's presence. It's noticing who he is. It's connecting with him. And we see this throughout the Bible. Jesus described a life of doing that. In this word, when he describes what a, a follower of Christ is, he says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. He's painting this picture of connecting with him, remaining with him, abiding with him, being with him. That's what's going on here. This is the call of a follower of Jesus Christ, and one of the ways we walk out that call is through connecting prayer, pausing our life and noticing what God is doing in us and in others. The second type of prayer is intercessory, intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer or intercession. We see this throughout the Bible a lot as well. All intercessory prayer is is praying for somebody else or praying for God to move. It's praying for something outside of your own realm of your needs, your wants, your desires. This is where prayer becomes this glorious mystery because what happens in intercessory prayer is we're seeing that God is coming and acting on earth in response to something human beings cried out for him to do. That's a mystery. That's amazing. God is such a God that when we go to him in prayer and ask him to move in a certain way, it moves his heart and he follows through and then acts out what we're asking him to do through his heavenly power, wisdom, and truth on earth where we live. There's power in intercessory prayer. Someone once said, history belongs to the intercessors. Because when we grow in this thing called intercessory prayer, it releases wonder. And it makes an amazing difference. Someone say, some would say, why even bother? God's just going to do what he wants because you can go do that and nothing happened. We're going to address that in this series. Because that's an important thing to talk about. But we have to understand that we pray because Jesus told us to pray. Because he knows that it's for our benefit and our good, not just in releasing things in the world, but he invites us to participate in what he is doing through prayer. And in doing that, being the good, perfect father he is, he knows that there's something beneficial for us when we go and do that. He invites us to participate in what he wants to do and release his good and his glory and his kingdom in the world. And this is where many of us get stuck because we pray things and they don't turn out like we pray. And we say, why do we pray when it seems like God is going to do what he wants to do anyway? On this side of heaven, when we're living in this day and age, in this place, we will always pray with equal part wonder and equal part mystery because he's God. And we're not going to be able to figure him out totally. We're not going to always know all of his ways. We can't. That would be insane for us to think we could. If we could figure out God exhaustively, know everything he knows, see everything he sees, he wouldn't be God. Almighty creator God is infinite. We are the creation. We are finite. The finite creature is not going to know exhaustively the infinite holy creator or else he wouldn't be God. So because he's God, there's always going to be this element of mystery, of things that we're not going to understand on this side of heaven. But more than anything else, what we need to understand is prayer is a profound invitation. Prayer is a profound invitation that God gives to all of us to come into his presence and participate with him on what he is doing in other people's lives. Author Tyler Staten wrote this, 
about intercessory prayer. He said, Jesus isn't describing prayer as some real-life version of wishes to a cosmic genie that occasionally come true when you figure out the formula. He's talking about the kind of prayers that start with love for someone else and end with inviting God's activity into places where that love is lacking. Intercession is the willful, intentional choice to turn from my needs, my desires, my wants, my pains, my sicknesses, my wishes, and willfully place the desires, needs, and heartbeats of other people above myself without anyone knowing I'm doing it, except God. When we do that, regardless of the result, what happens is a little bit of God starts to rub off onto us, and we start to become transformed in his presence. Regardless of the result, when we take up the needs, heartbeats, desires of another, pause ourselves, run into the throne room of heaven, bring that person or that situation before God, a part of what is God's begins to rub off on, else, on us, and we begin to grow spiritually. There's another type of prayer. It's called petition prayer. Connecting prayer, intercessory prayer, and petition prayer. This is simply asking God for what you need. Jesus modeled this when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, and he gave them what we call the Lord's Prayer. And he said, ask for your daily bread. As a loving heavenly father, he wants his children to come and ask him for things. He wants us to go and ask him for what we need. He wants us to bring our needs to him. To enter his presence and tell us what we need. Now, as I said, we're going to deal with the unanswered prayer later in the series. Because as I say this, for some of you, that's the first thing that comes to your mind. But I ask for what things and he doesn't give them to me. Sometimes when we pray, God grants our requests. Sometimes when we pray, he says no. Sometimes when we pray, he says not yet. But through it all, we have to understand who it is we're talking to and that he is good. And he knows what is best. And he sees and understands things that we will never understand. And as I sit here, I think to myself, thank God he doesn't answer all my prayers. Why? Because I prayed for some really stupid things. I don't know everything. I don't know what's best all the time, 24-7. Thank God I go before him and I give him my prayer. And he says, oh, yeah, that. And I give him another prayer. He's like, ooh, we'll set that one over here. And <laughs> you see, we have this idea that God is only good if he gives me everything I ask for. And nothing could be further from the truth. What kind of parent does that on an earthly level? Let's take it out of the heavenly level, just put it on the earthly level. What, what do you call a kid that gets every single thing they want? Spoiled brat, right? What do you call a parent that gives a child everything they ask for? A grandparent, <laughs> right? It's not good. Now, we get that on an earthly level. Let's put it on a level of things that we'll never understand because we're not God. Areas he sees that we can't see. Areas he knows that we can't know. Areas he feels that we can't feel because he lives outside of our time and space. Do you trust his goodness? Even when he doesn't answer your prayer the way you want him to? He's good. He could be trustworthy. You can tell him everything and then trust that he will do with it what he wants. There's a pastor, Chris Dolson, who gave an amazing sermon on the goodness of God, and I stole the spoiled brat grandparent thing from him, but he lays out this whole idea that no matter what we pray and say, God is good and he knows what we need. So 
as we begin 2023, let's refresh prayer and re-engage with prayer. A couple things on doing that. First of all, don't evaluate yourself. So many people say, I can't pray because I don't do it right and I don't do this right. And I mean, you, prayer is an act of love. It's an act of love to God. It's not to be judged or evaluated. Have you ever gone to a wedding where the bride comes down and the groom is here and then a group of 10 people, judges, come out with clipboards and go, well, how do you think the love factor was there? Oh, I'd give it about a three. I guess. No, that's ridiculous. Prayer, you're coming into your heavenly Father's presence who loves you more than you understand and know. You don't have to judge that. You don't have to evaluate that. Just do it. Just go be with your dad. The only rule of prayer is just show up. This is an act of love. So many people are robbed from the joy of being with God because they say, well, I don't pray like he does or I don't pray like she does. Just go and pray. Be with God. Number two, start small. If sitting and praying for 15 minutes seems like an eternity and something so hard, do it for 30 seconds. Start small and build up. Rhythm is more important than duration. Consistency is more important than length. Consistent short times is better than trying to tackle one big long time of prayer. I have found when it comes to praying that if I give God a little bit of space to work with, he jumps into that space and meets me there and then teaches me as I go. When you start off this thing called prayer, I encourage you, start small. I also want to encourage you to attend prayer meetings. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but show up at a prayer meeting and just sit and don't say a word. Any prayer meeting that Cross Your Church has, you have permission from all of us to come and just sit and never ever say a word and get up and leave, and that's totally okay. Because you're sitting in God's presence. And I learned how to pray by sitting in prayer meetings and listening to others pray. It's not about making sure it's all done right. It's about the act of going before our Heavenly Father and being in His presence. I want to close with a story that was a marvel, wonder, awe God story in the lives of the DeRoshi family. And I'm going to tell you something. As preachers, sometimes we're trained, especially when we talk about prayer, to not tell the stories that are sensational and and wow, God can't, that's amazing, and, and over-the-top, crazy God stories. We're told, we're trained sometimes not to say that in the pulpit and tell those stories. And the reason they train us to do that is they say, because if you tell of all those stories, and that's what you say, when people leave here, they say, well, I've never experienced God like that, so I must be off or not doing something. And so the answer is to not tell the stories. But what I've found, if we do that, then the awe of God dies in my life and the awe of God dies in your life. And you walk out thinking, God could never do anything that great. And so I'm going to tell you these stories. And the people preaching are going to tell you these stories. And we're going to be a church that looks at these stories that because we want to be a church that gets captivated by the awe of God and the wonder of God. And we want to be a church that is blown away by what God does to the point where we can't understand it and we can't calculate it and we can't take out Google and figure it out because it's just too amazing what God is doing. We want God to blow the circuitry of our spirits and our minds and our thoughts because when he does that, he's just given us a little bit of a taste of who he is. We want to know God in that way, not the can set professional way. So here's a story. This book next to the Bible is probably the most important book in my library and my bookshelf, and I've never, ever read it because there's a story behind this book. So in 2007, our family uh, was sensing that God was leading us to go to the mission field, to go overseas and get out of pastoral ministry. My wife is a teacher. She's going to get out of teaching, and we're going to take our kids, who at the time were six and nine, and go to another country and do God's work in another country. And so we applied with our denomination's mission. We went through all the training, and we thought we were headed to Peru. That was what was 
on the tablet. We, got, we, were, we knew people in Peru. We got to know the team there. We visited there. We thought that's where we were going. But then we went to training, and they said to us, will you consider going to Portugal? I never even heard of Portugal. I was like, sure, what country is that in? And so we, it kind of threw us back because we were thinking Peru. And then we started thinking, man, there's a lot of people that want us to go to Peru. And we're going to disappoint them if we don't go. And if we go to this other place, what's that going to be like? And it was this big, huge, huge question mark that was causing lots of sleepless nights and anxiety. And so we said, let's go away and let's take some time and pray. And we're going to pray and we're going to ask God, is it Portugal or is it Peru? And man, we wish that God would just send us an email, write it in the sky. But we've been at this long enough knowing that we're probably not going to get anything like that. We're just going to go, we're going to pray and ask and not feel a lot of different things. And eventually we're just going to have to try to figure out a decision. And so we went up to Door County to a resort uh, place there. It has lots of vacation condos. And in this bank of condos, there was this little library where you can go and get books and uh, get games. We've gone to this place several times before. And we walked into the condo unit where we were staying. And at the dining room table, there was some games and a stack of books. And it's the first time ever that's happened because usually when they come in in between guests, they clean all that out, bring all that stuff back. And this book was sitting on top of the stack of books. Now, remember, we're going there to pray and ask God whether it, we should really go to Portugal or we should stay and go to Peru because we were given the choice. And so we walk in and this book is sitting there and I never saw games and book at the table before. I thought this is really weird. And I pick up this book and it's called Pleasure by the Bus Load. And the minute you open this book up to the front or back cover, there's a map of Portugal <laughs> and a VW micro bus full of a family. This book is about a family that takes an adventure to Portugal. Nobody reads a book about a family taking an adventure to Portugal. I remember when this came in, I came back and I talked to Doug Gallick and I said, I got to tell you what happened. I showed him what happened. And Doug Gallick said, the only reason this book was published was for that moment right there. Because no one would read a book about that. I took it. And I keep it with me to remind me of the wonder of God. That God is able to do so much more than we can ask or think. That God is able to blow our minds if we give him the time and space to come in. And wouldn't you rather live a life where God comes in and blows you away than to have your life all figured out? Because when we stand before him in heaven, it's going to be one amazing wave after another, after another, after another. So this series, I give you an invitation. First of all, I'm going to ask you to start beginning to pray for what I call your three. Pray for your three. I want you to pick three things over the next eight weeks that you're going to pray daily for. Three things over the next eight weeks that you're going to pray daily for. It could be a character trait in you, like, God, I want to know you more. God, I want more holiness. God, I want more peace. God, I more, want more uh, love in my life. God, I want more uh, understanding of who you are. God, I want more holiness. It could be for a person. I'm going to pray for that person for eight weeks so they get closer to God. It could be for a place like Ukraine, or a place where our missionaries serve and work. Or the missionaries at church. It could be for Crossview Church. I don't care what it is. You have plenty. It could be your workplace. It could be a coworker. But I want you to pick three people, places, or things that you're going to pray for for eight weeks. And we're going to call it your three. And don't tell anybody what they are. Except God. So I'm going to encourage you to pray for your three. Number two, I'm going to encourage you to grab a bookmark. For this series, we printed up these bookmarks as just a reminder of what we're doing. And if you, when you leave, there's going to be a bunch of these on a table in the back. And the one side has our definition of prayer. Prayer is a personal encounter with God. And then here's like a way for you to pray, to pause, to sit and remember who we're talking to. Maybe get a verse and look it over. To relate, to confess to God your sins and be with him. To ask and to yield. 
And on the right side, we kind of break those out so you know what we're talking about. Pause, to be still and know, to be quiet, to reflect on Scripture, to relate, to confess and listen to God and what he might be saying to you. Notice God. Be present. Then ask for you, for others, and we have right there on the card your three. Take time to ask for your three. And then when you wrap up your prayer time, give God this amazing prayer of yielding to him and say, God, I surrender my whole life to you. God, I want to obey everything you say. God, will you help me to walk out the love that you have for me, but for other, many other people? So grab a card. Pray your three. Grab a card. And then finally, I encourage you to check out the weekly prayer meetings across you. We have two prayer meetings that happen a week here. On Sunday mornings from 8 to 8.30, there's a prayer meeting that goes on in the prayer room. And every Wednesday now from noon to 12.30, there'll be a prayer meeting here. Just come. You have my permission on your lunch hour on Wednesday to come walking in, sit in the prayer meeting, not say a word, take in the presence of God, and go back to your workplace. That's an amazing thing. Just pause your soul and be with God in the middle of the week with a group of people. It's a great, great thing. And if you can't come to the prayer meeting, create your own prayer meeting. Maybe hide out in a room at your workplace for a few minutes and just sit and be in God's presence. Let this prayer series be the start of an adventure for us as a church. Let this be the start of an adventure where prayer isn't this white noise of our life, but prayer is really what it really is, us coming into the presence and having a personal encounter with Almighty God. Every week during the series, we're going to close the same way, whoever's preaching. And, and the way we're going to close is we're going to teach you a skill that's helped us as pastors and elders over the last year especially. We learned this skill, and it's just a great thing. The skill is simply just praying Scripture back to God. And what I love about praying Scripture back to God is you never run out of things to pray for. You have a whole book that you can pray for. And some people say, I don't know what to say when I pray. With praying scripture back to God, it tells you exactly what to say. It gives you all you need. And I've found now that if I don't pray scripture back to God at times, I forget and run out of things to pray for. But you can never do that with this. So we want to model this each time in this series as we preach. And today's no different. So I'm going to close by praying this scripture back to God. And when I do that, you can do a number of things. You can just bow your head and be quiet. You could read, look and watch what I'm doing by looking this on the screen. You could pay attention. You could totally check out and just go say your own prayer to God. I don't care. Whatever you want to do, feel free to do. But we just want to model this as a way to teach you another way to pray, and that's to pray God's words back to him. So let's go to God in his presence, and I encourage you to bow your head or do whatever you want as we come into his presence, as I pray this passage back to him and as we close this sermon. Remain in me as I also remain in you. Jesus, I thank you for that invitation to remain in you. I thank you that you call us to remain in you. God, I thank you that when we remain in you, you promise to remain in us. Lord, help us to notice you more as you remain in us. Help us to notice ourselves more. Help us to notice what you're doing more. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in me. It must remain in the vine. God, you are the source of life. You are this vine, and, and our call is to stay in with you. You keep us in your, you, the vine. Help us to stay engrafted in you where we find life. God, I pray that staying in you in the vine would become a greater, better place than staying with you outside the vine. That life inside of you, the vine, would take on a meaning and a definition in our life that we would not find anywhere else. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. God, we want to be people that bear spiritual fruit. We want to be people of love. We want to be people of wisdom. We want to be people of goodness and kindness and mercy and grace and self-control and truth. These are fruits 
that come from being engrafted in you, will you let that happen in our lives individually and collectively as Crossview Church? So God, we give this prayer to you and we give you this whole series. No matter where we're at in this thing called prayer, God, will you take us to the next level? We ask that it is a gift of grace and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may stand. Receive these words of blessing as you go out from here this week and as we launch this new series on prayer. This comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, and it says this, Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to do and accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. have a blessed week.